Hey, so give yourself a hand today. Let me tell you why. You are, you are attending the least attended Sunday of the year across the nation, and you are in church this morning, so give yourself a hand. You deserve it for being here today. I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much for making the effort to be here today. Let me remind you, we haven't said much about it lately, but our theme for this year is to live generously. And we want to remind you on a regular basis, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, don't look out for your own interests but look out for the interests of others. And I want to challenge you as a part of the Hollywood Community Church family, during the week, let's look for opportunities to demonstrate generosity and live not for ourselves, but to live for others. Let me encourage you today to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah in the Old Testament. You say, Brian, where is that? It's right in between Obadiah and Micah, if that helps you. You might want to, you might want to just want to look in the index in the front and have it. Sometimes it's a little difficult to uh, navigate through uh, the Old Testament. So let me ask you today, have you ever wanted to just run away? I'm talking about just absolutely escape and run away from everything. You've probably seen some of the uh, Southwest Airlines commercials that humorously, humorously illustrate our desire to run away. If you haven't seen one, here is one of those commercials. Let's look at it quickly. There's been a breach. General, there's been a breach. We need your password so we can lock down the system. My password? Yes, sir, we need your password. The password that I use? Yes, sir, your password. There's been another breach. Sir. Right, okay, I, H, A, T E M Y J O B one. I hate my job. One. Want to get away? Now you can with Southwest Ferris as low as fifty nine dollars one way. Yes to low Ferris with nothing to hide. That's transparency. All right. You ever had one of those moments? You ever had one of those moments where you just kind of want to crawl under a rock? You just want to kind of run away, whether it's hop on a, an airline or whatever, and just get away. I have to confess that historically, I am an excellent escape artist, all right? When I was a teenager, I had the ability to detect whenever mom and dad was going to assign one of us kids a task. I have a twin brother and I have a younger sister, and I just had this radar that mom and dad were about to assign us a task, and I had the unique ability to sneak out of the house or to sneak downstairs until the task, the job was given to either my brother or my sister. I learned to escape. As an adult though, I'm still guilty of that. And I'm still good at that. I'm confessing in front of my wife today, so I might need somebody to take me out to lunch afterward, but <laughs> feeding our daughter Amber is not always easy. And there have been occasions when it's time to feed Amber and I pretend like I'm busy so that Vicky will feed her, all right? I confess. Is that terrible? Is that terrible that I've done that? Is that terrible? She probably knows me well enough. She knows that, that I'm doing that. Now, now, before you're too critical of me, I imagine that you are slippery as well, all right? I imagine that you have learned, there are times that you have learned to kind of slip out of certain situations. The, the point is this, it is, it is easy for us to run from something we don't want to do. Does that make sense? It's easy for us to escape, it's easy for us to flee, it's easy for us to run from something that we don't want to do. That's what we see taking place in the passage of scripture that we're reading today. So today we begin a brand new series, four weeks, on the book of Jonah. We prayed about this as a staff. I'm really excited. Not only are you going to hear this amazing story the next four weeks, but I believe there's going to be some unbelievably practical truths as we unpack this that is going to impact your life. And so let me encourage you to be faithful as we study through this. So today we're going to read through Jonah chapter 1. And so grab your Bibles, your iPad, your phone, follow up on the screen. I'm going to read the first se or all 17 verses of this chapter, so follow along. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil 
has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Notice Jonah wasn't just escaping from the assignment that God gave him to do, but we find Jonah actually trying to run from God's presence. How foolish is that? But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we might not perish." They said to one another, come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. At least this theology hadn't changed, right? Then the men who were exceedingly fray, uh, the, men, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, "What is this that you have done?" For the men knew that he was fleeing. Notice once again, from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. Then they said to him, "What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us?" For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, "Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you." Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have just to come together as a church family today. Father, you know the week that every single one of us have had, and I'm sure some of us have gone through a difficult week and maybe experienced some trials, and maybe some others here today have had an incredibly blessed week. But Lord, whatever our situation is, we come together as a family for the purpose of worshiping you. And our prayer is that you would be honored and glorified, not only through the words that come out of our mouth, but through the attitude of our hearts. And as we look at this awesome story, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see truth. Help us to see your truth. Help us to realize that we cannot run from you. Lord, I do pray if there's somebody here today that is running from God, whether physically or or spiritually or whatever, God, I pray that today that they would help, that you would help them to sense your presence and you would bring them back to yourself. And then, Lord, for those of us who just maybe are not doing some things that honor and glorify you, there's some things in our life that you don't want us to do and we're doing or you want us to do and we're not doing. Help us not to follow the example of Jonah. But, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to follow your direction, your mission for our lives. And we promise to give you all the praise and honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so this book begins with the phrase, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. I say that because many people today have doubted and do doubt the authenticity of this book. No doubt you've heard someone say that the, the story of Jonah is just a fictional story, has application to us, but it really didn't happen. But it's important for us to realize that here in the text that Jonah is not presented as a fictional character. 
As a matter of fact, Jonah is portrayed here in this verse and throughout Scripture as an actual person. He's mentioned, for example, in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. Let me put it up on the screen. It says, he restored, speaking of the king of Israel, he restored the border of Israel from Lebohamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, notice who it is, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. I'll just pause there. And so we see that Jonah was an historical figure. His ministry followed that of Elisha in the Old Testament. You've heard of Elijah and then Elisha. Jonah's ministry followed that of Elisha. He prophesied the extension of Jeroboam's kingdom, which is found there in 2 Kings chapter 14. He was probably a graduate of the school of the prophets, which which Elisha started. And some believe that he actually led later on the school of the prophets. It's important to note that Jesus mentions him three different times in the Gospels. And so Jesus puts his stamp of approval on the life and the authenticity of Jonah. He's mentioned in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 16, and he's mentioned in Luke chapter 11. In verse 2, Jonah is given a simple command. God tells him, arise, arise, get up, Jonah. The Hebrew term doesn't just mean to get up. It doesn't just mean to, you know, get out of your seat and go do something. It means to get up and to do it now with a sense of urgency. I like to explain when when I was growing up, my mom, as I mentioned, she would want us to do different things. And so at times she would just call us. And sometimes she would say, Brian, come here. And I knew if she said, Brian, come here, that I had to come. But if she said, Brian Lee Burkholder, you get in here right now, she was speaking with what? Just a little bit more sense of urgency. And I realized at that moment that even if I was hiding outside or if I was hiding downstairs, I had to come upstairs right now because mom wanted me. That's what the word arise means. Jonah, arise. Get going with a sense of urgency. Now, here's what Jonah is told. Jonah is told to get up and go to Nineveh, the text says, and preach against their evil. But, but what I want us to notice today is Jonah's response. Because Jonah's response, quite frankly, is similar to the way that you and I respond to the call of God and the mission of God in our lives on a regular basis. Our tendency is to be critical of Jonah. If God would have called me, I would have gone. If God wanted me to do this, I would have done it. Really? How about all the times that God calls us to do things now and we just don't do them? So here's a couple of practical applications. If, if, you're, if you have your outline, the first thing that I wrote down is this. God's mission is not always what we want. God's mission is not something that we always want to do. In other words, God sometimes asks us to do things that we don't want to do, right? Whether it's waking up early on Sunday mornings to take your family to church, whether it's having an awkward conversation with that friend who claims to be an agnostic and doesn't know Jesus, whether it's being kind to that obnoxious neighbor of yours who just absolutely aggravates the living daylights out of you. We all have people like that in our lives. And sometimes what God calls us to do is not what we want to do. It's not our natural reaction. It's not our natural response. That's what Jonah experienced here in the passage He was commanded to go and do something that he personally did not want to do. So here's exactly what he was told. He was told to go to the city of Nineveh. Let me give you just a little background facts of Nineveh. So so Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Many historians believe that Nineveh was at that time the largest city in the world. It was found some 500 miles away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
It was an incredibly wicked city that was known for its, for its cruelty. As a matter of fact, you can Google the cruelty of the Ninevites, and you will see that they were known for some of the most atrocious, horrendous, cruel behavior in the history of the world. That's the people to whom God was calling Jonah. Now, as I sit back and read this and think about this, and you too, you would think that a graduate of the school of the prophets would jump at such an opportunity. All right, so Jonah, you've been trained in ministry. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go not to the easiest place, but I want you to go to the hardest place, and I want you to go to the hardest place, and I want you to preach the gospel. To some people, that would be like, yeah, man, I am all in. That's exactly what I want to do. Not Jonah. Jonah's like, man, that's not what I want to do. And quite frankly, Jonah had the same response that many of us have. He bolts to Tarshish. God calls him to Nineveh, and here's what he does. Jonah flees to Tarshish. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Instead of going where God commanded him to go, Jonah heads in the opposite direction. God told him to go right. Jonah didn't go right. He went what? He went left. God told him to go east. Jonah didn't go east. He went west. I mentioned that Nineveh was 500 miles to the east of Jerusalem. Tarshish was 2,000 miles to the west of Jerusalem. I think we have a map that you can see where it was. So God called him to go to Nineveh. Jonah heads absolutely a different direction. Jonah's response was one of complete disobedience. Jonah, here's what I want you to do. And Jonah's response was, no, I'm not doing that. I am doing the exact opposite of that. I am heading in the opposite direction of where you want me to go. Now, as I mentioned before, you and I ridicule him. I would argue, once again, that we often have the same response. What God wants us to do, what we know God wants us to do is difficult, and so instead of doing it, instead of heading in the direction that God wants us to head to the east, we say, no, the east doesn't make any sense for me. I'm heading west, and we go in the opposite direction. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Well, Although God has called me to be a single person to sexual purity, <laughs> I just realized that in this day and age, that's not realistic. And so even though God's called me to sexual purity, I choose to be sexually active. Why? Because I know better than God. God wants me to go this direction. I'm going this direction. Although the Bible encourages me to demonstrate integrity in my business, I choose to be occasionally dishonest because you know as well as I do, you just can't be successful in South Florida in business unless you're occasion, occasionally dishonest. You'll get, Brian, you know God, I know God's called me to integrity, but there's times that I just can't. There's times that I have to do something else. I have to go in the other direction. God calls me to be a good steward of my finances and give a portion of what I make to him. But Brian, that just doesn't make good financial sense for me. I'm a better steward of my finances than God is. I could give example after example, and you could give example after example. Here's the truth, church. We regularly do the complete opposite of what we are called to do. Because God's mission isn't what we want. And since God's vision isn't what we envision it to be, we tend to run in the opposite direction. So let me ask you today, are you headed toward Nineveh? Or are you headed towards Tarshish? Are you going east? Or are you going west? When God said go right, did you say no, going right doesn't make any sense? I'm heading left. There's a second truth that we can pull from this passage, and it ties right in with the first. The, section is, the second is this. There will always be a way for you to run from God. There will always be a way for you and I to run from God. 
Notice, Jonah didn't have to search long and hard to find a way to run from the Lord. Jonah simply went to the place where fleeing was possible. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Well, verse 3 says that he went down to Joppa, and in Joppa, Joppa was a port city. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. You see, in Jonah's frustration with God, and in Jonah's lack of faith, he went to the place where escape was possible. I want you to catch this, church, because it's so practical. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And so he went to the place where disobeying God was easier than obeying God. He went to the port of Joppa where boats were constantly coming and going. Now, you might sit back and say, Brian, maybe he went to Joppa and his plan was to get on a boat to Nineveh and he just accidentally bought the wrong ticket and he headed to Tarshish. Did you see the map? You don't go to Nineveh by boat, all right? You can't get there by boat. Why in the world is he headed to a port city when you can't get to Nineveh by boat? In other words, he is putting himself in a position where disobeying God became easy for him. How unwise was that? How foolish was that? Once again, he put himself in a position where running from God was easy. I know we're getting really practical today, but let's just pause for a moment and think about how often we do the same thing. How often do I do the same thing? How often do you do the same thing in our lives? In the midst of our spiritual struggles, there are certainly places that you and I need to avoid. And so I wrote this. You can write this in your outlines. Don't put yourself in a position where running from God is easy. You could actually say, don't put yourself in a position where disobeying God is easy. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Let me give you a couple of examples. If you're struggling with alcoholism, you don't sit back and say, let's go to this bar and have dinner tonight. It's just not wise. You don't put yourself in that position. Guys, if you you struggle with impure thoughts, you don't sit down and say, okay, the wife's away, the kids are away. I'm going to surf the internet here all by myself. That's just not wise. If you're tempted to be unfaithful to your spouse, you don't reach out to your ex on Facebook Messenger. It's just not something you do. Those are all areas that are easily acceptable. Yet what do they do? They pull us away from God's direction for our life. And I find that often we put ourselves, we intentionally put ourselves in a place where sin becomes easy. We put ourselves in a position where disobeying God becomes easy. Running from God becomes easy. So so can I ask you today, would you do a little bit of self-inventory? What is your struggle? What is your port of Joppa that you should avoid at all costs? What is the port of Joppa that you should never go to, that you should never visit? Because it's that place that is going to lead you far away from God. Don't go there. Jonah went to the place where he could easily disobey God. So verse 3 says this, sure enough, what did he find? He found a ship going to Tarshish. Now think with me how Jonah might have rationalized and how we might rationalize. He goes to the port and he says, you know what? Okay, I know I need to go to Nineveh, but God, if you want me to go somewhere else to Nineveh, when I get to the port, may there be a ship that's heading in the other direction. And so he, he, he arrives at the port and guess what? Man, there's a ship headed to Tarshish. This has got to be God's will for my life. If God didn't want me to go to Tarshish, he would have canceled all of the voyages. He wouldn't have allowed me to have this opportunity. It must be God's will. Have you ever done that in your life? You know God wanted you to do this or that, and 
You put yourself in a situation to sin, and all of a sudden, you find yourself justifying your actions and even maybe blaming God for your actions. Be careful, church. It is so easy for us to justify our sin. To sit back and say, no, this must be of God. Just because a terrific opportunity presents itself does not mean that that opportunity is from God, especially if that opportunity is taking you in the opposite direction of where God wants you to go. Man, I've heard in, in almost 40 years of ministry, I've heard everything you can imagine Man, Pastor Brian, I know, it sounds funny, but God wants me to leave my wife because he put this other lady in my life, and he would have never put this other lady in my life if he wouldn't have wanted me to leave my wife, so, so it's God's will that I do this. Hey, Brian, it's God's will that, that, that I take this job. I know that I'm not ever going to be able to be in church, and it's going to disconnect my family from church, but you know what, Brian? I'm confident God opened the door. This is what God wants me to do. Man, Brian, I know we're going to get our kids involved in this, and I know it's going to pull our kids away from church, but Brian, this is such a great opportunity. God's hand must be in this. Church, be careful. Be careful. We often credit God with the devil's work in our lives. God is leading us in one direction, and just because an opportunity opens up in the other direction, we say, oh, that must be of God. That's exactly what Jonah did. God wants me to go here, but wow, look at this opportunity. I'm heading here. And that ship led him further and further and further away from God's will for his life. Let me ask you, church, can you do a little bit of self-inventory today? Have the opportunities in your life really been God-honoring? Have the opportunities in your life really been faith-building opportunities? Or just maybe, just maybe, have you boarded a ship that seemed to work out well for you, but it took you in the opposite direction of where God wants you to go? I don't know how many times in my life I've met with people who said, man, Brian, you know what? When I was a young man, I was confident God called me into the ministry. But I, I just didn't feel it. <laughs> it wasn't a path that I wanted to take. And I went a completely different path. And now years later, I regret it. Man, Brian, when I was this age, I knew God wanted me to do this. And for some reason, it didn't make any sense to me at that time. And I went in the opposite direction. And time after time, I've had conversations with people who have expressed unbelievable regret because later in life, they find themselves thousands of miles away from where God wanted them to be. It's exactly what Jonah did. God had a mission for Jonah, and he headed in the wrong direction. Let me show you a third truth that we can pull from this story. The third truth is this. God may use storms to get your attention. God very honestly may use a storm or storms in your life to get your attention. Throughout Scripture, the Bible mentions that God used some rather unusual things to get man's attention. For example, he used the burning bush to speak to Moses. Remember that in Exodus chapter 3? He used a donkey to speak to Balaam in the book of Numbers. He spoke to Job through a whirlwind. He used a rooster to preach a sermon to Peter. God has a way of taking all kinds of different mediums and using them to speak to us. Well, here in the book of Jonah... God uses a storm. He uses a storm to speak to Jonah. Verse 4 says this, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. It doesn't say that, man, what a, what a coincidence 
The boat went this way, and there was a storm this way. The text says very clearly that it was God. It was the Lord who hurled the wind upon the sea. And by the way, this just wasn't any storm. This was a storm that terrified well-trained sailors. You notice that the sailors did two things, and we're kind of just walking through the passage quickly, but the sailors did two things. The first thing is they prayed to their gods. Hey, these guys were terrified. These were guys that had experienced a lot of storms out on the Mediterranean Ocean. They'd experienced them before, but this storm was different. This storm was so severe. This storm was so ferocious that we find these men praying to their gods. They're not praying to Jehovah God. They're praying to their gods. You say, Brian, to whom would they have prayed? They would have prayed to Asherod, the sea goddess. They would have prayed to Baal Shaman, the god of the sky. They would have prayed to Baal Tyre, the god of the sailors. They were so terrified, they were crying out to their gods. But it's interesting to me, it's sadly humorous, that while they are praying and crying out to their gods, where's Jonah? (laughs) What's Jonah doing? Jonah's down in the bottom of the ship, sound asleep. Verse 6 says that the captain comes to him and says, What do you mean, you sleeper? You lazy bum. Get up. Wake up. Cry out to your God. Maybe your God is the one who will save us. So we find these guys, these sailors cried out to their gods. The second thing they did was very significant. They threw out their cargo. If you read verses 4 and 5, they took the cargo that was on the ship and they threw it off the ship to lighten the load in order to save the ship, in order to save their lives. They got rid of the cargo. I would remind you, this was their investment. This was their livelihood. Yet in order to save the ship, in order to save their own lives, they threw away their own capital. They threw away what they were going to make. Notice several truths that we can pull from that. The first truth is this. Your sin affects others. Because of whose sin had the storm come upon the boat? Jonah. Not the sailors. It was... It was Jonah's fault that this tempest had come. It was Jonah's fault that they were experiencing this. It was Jonah's was the one who was fleeing from God. Yet because of Jonah's sin, who paid the price for it? These sailors paid the price for Jonah's sin. And church, I would remind you that be assured that your sin, like the sin of Jonah, affects those around you. I don't know how many times I've had somebody say, hey, Brian, it's my sin, it's my life, I'm not hurting anybody else, I have the right to do whatever I want to do. How foolish. You don't live on an island. You're not all by yourself. Your sin affects others. Whether it's your family or whether it's a family that is broken due to immorality, whether it's emotions that are scarred due to arrogance and anger, whether it's children who fail to acknowledge Christ because of the unfaithfulness of their parents, please know that your sin and the consequences of your sin will affect others. Reminded of Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23 that simply says this, be sure your sin will find you out can't hide from it. You can't hide from the sin, and you can't hide from the consequences. The other thing that I wrote down in my notes is this. It took a storm to cause Jonah to confess his disobedience. It took a storm. It took a life-threatening event for Jonah to come to his senses and realize that He was not doing, he was not being who God wanted him to be. Let me ask you this. What will God have to do in your life in order for you to head, in order for you to admit, I'm sorry, that you are heading in the wrong direction? Let me say it again. What will God have to do in your life 
in order for you to admit that you are heading in the wrong direction. Sometimes it's so easy for us to see the failures of others and so difficult for us to see our own weaknesses, our own sins, our own failures. Yet God in his grace intentionally puts us into situations that demonstrate our sin. I want you to catch this because this is important. God sent the storm not as a demonstration of his anger to Jonah. God sent the storm as a demonstration of his grace to Jonah. Do you catch that? God sent the storm not as an act of judgment. God sent the storm as an act of grace in Jonah's life because he wanted Jonah to realize you're on the wrong boat. You're headed in the wrong direction. And God in his grace is giving Jonah a second chance. Let me ask you today, what is the lesson that God is wanting to teach you through the storms of your life. Don't miss the lesson. I remember, you guys know I just lived it. I had my first heart attack when I was 36 years old. At 36, I had triple bypass open heart surgery, and I remember recovering in a lazy boy chair at our house days and weeks after our surgery, sitting back saying, okay, God, please show me the lesson that you want me to catch here, because I don't want to repeat this grade again. <laughs> I don't want to have to take this course again. God, God, show me the lesson that you have for me in the midst of this storm. And God gave me some lessons through that that have changed my life. What, what is God saying to you? What are the storms of your life? Now, 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 please don't always think every time God sends a storm, it's an act of punishment. It's not. I believe many times the storm is an act of grace. Where God is sitting back and saying, you're valuable to me. You're so valuable to me. I don't want to lose you to Tarshish. You're so valuable to me. I don't want you to go the wrong direction. And so in my grace and in my mercy, I'm going to do something drastic that's going to grab your attention because I want you to go in the right direction. That's exactly what is taking place with Jonah. God uses the storm to get Jonah's attention. And it does get Jonah's attention. He sits back and says, the storm is because of me. Let me show you a fourth thing. Fourth thing is this. God may use a fish, in quotes, to get you back on track. God, God may use something completely unexpected something completely out of the ordinary, something completely unexplainable to get you back on track. So here's what happens. Jonah tells the crew to throw him into the sea. Uh, I mean, think through that. They're in the midst of the storm, and, and Jonah, you know, whether he's being altruistic or saying, okay, I want to be the martyr, lose me so that everybody else is saved, whatever his motives, Jonah's, Jonah's response to the sailors is this, I want you to throw me into the sea. I don't know how you view his response. I view his response as a sad one. Because I think, the text doesn't indicate, and, and we're just, we're, we're guessing, but to me, there were other ways that Jonah could have stopped the storm. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Jonah could have prayed. God, I've, I've fallen away from you. I've sinned. Please forgive me. Stop the storm. But we don't find Jonah praying in the book. Jonah could have surrendered. We could have find Jonah saying, okay, God, I get it. I'm heading the wrong direction. I will go to Nineveh. God, do whatever you got to do. Put us on land, and I promise whatever port we land in from there, I'm heading to Nineveh. But that's not what Jonah did. That's not how he responded. Surprisingly, Jonah determined he would rather die than do God's Here's what happened. Jonah decided to conclude the story. Jonah decided, you know what? I want the story to end right here. I won't be God's prophet. I will not preach to the, to the Ninevites. I want the story to end 
right here. Throw me overboard. Make this the end of it. You throw me overboard, I won't live, but the storm will cease. Reluctantly, the text says that the sailors hurled Jonah. By the way, I think it's interesting the word hurl is found like four times in this chapter. The, the sailors hurled Jonah into the Mediterranean Ocean. From a human perspective, we read verse 16 and we think, end of story. <laughs> Who's ever survived being thrown overboard in the midst of a storm? How often do we hear people falling off cruises and, and we never hear from that person again? From a human perspective, we read verse 16 and the book ends right there. But I want you to catch this. Jonah might have been done with God, but God wasn't done with Jonah. If there's a story in chapter one, it's that Jonah might have been done with God, but God in his grace, God in his mercy, God in his sovereignty, God was not done with Jonah. Man, church, aren't you grateful for the moments in your life where you blew it to such a point that you sit back and thought, man, I'm unusable. God can't use me anymore. The end of the story. God, this is where it ends. And God sits back and says, no, it doesn't end there. My grace is sufficient for you. My forgiveness is available for you. God's grace was still available and at work in Jonah's life. I find verse 17 to be one of the most interesting verses in the Bible. Verse 17 says this, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You might sit back and I know you've got all kinds of questions. What type of fish was it? How did he survive in the fish's belly? We'll try to talk about that stuff in the next few weeks. That's really not the important part the story. By the way, if you sit back and say, this is an impossibility, it could not happen, I have two. I can send them to you. I have two stories of individuals who were swallowed by great fishes. They were in the belly of those, is that right, fishes or fish? Is that right? Fish. They were in the belly of those fish several days, and guess what? They survived. There's two stories in history of that taking place. So what is the lesson for us today? Let uh, Let me pull all of this together and a lesson for us. The first is this, God is omnipotent over his creation. God is omnipotent. It was God who hurled the storm. It was God who started the storm. It was God who stopped the storm. It was God who sent that fish to that place. It wasn't just a mere coincidence that when Jonah went over the boat, they happened to be in a place where sperm whales were, where great white sharks were. It was just a great big coincidence. It wasn't. There's an omnipotent God who was behind the story of Jonah, who was behind Jonah's life, who was orchestrating all of the details. God is omnipotent over his creation. And the second thing is this, God is sovereign over your future. Just as God was sovereign over Jonah's future, God is sovereign over your future. So the simple truth is this, you and I, we cannot run from God. There's no way that you can run from God. There's no way that I can run from God. I love how the psalmist said it in Psalm 139. David David wrestled with this, or the psalmist wrestled with this and said this in Psalm 139 and verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit? Or, Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol in the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in, notice this, the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, as in the case of Jonah, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold. I would submit to you that when Jonah was being tossed in those waves before he was swallowed by that fish, he was not alone. The mighty hand of a sovereign God had a hold of his hand, and God was controlling that situation. And even though Jonah thought that he could run from God's presence, he could not run from God even in the midst of the sea. And I would submit that you can't 
So let me ask you today, are you running from God's mission for your life? Is there something that God wants you to do and you are not doing it? He wants you to go right, but you've opted to go left. He wants you to go east, but you've opted to go west. For whatever reason, whether you think it makes sense or not, you've chosen to not follow God's plan. Let me challenge you today with the thought that God is relentlessly chasing you. And just like Jonah, he will not give up on you, nor will he give up on your life until his plan is fulfilled in your life. You can't run from God. We can't run from God. Would you stand with me and let's pray today as Stephen and the team come. Maybe you're here today and for some reason, for a period of time, you've been running from God. Maybe it's intentionally, maybe it's unintentionally. You're living a lifestyle that you know God does not want you to live. You're clear about that. You know what God says in his word, and, and yet you have chosen to do that. Can I challenge you today to do a 180-degree turn? Can I challenge you today to repent of your sin Change your mind, which will change your actions, and stop running away from God and begin running towards God. Is there something God wants you to do? You know God wants you to do this, whatever it is, whether it's big or small. Is there something God wants you to do, but you are not doing it? This was God's mission for your life, but you've chosen something else. Today, would you... Would you be sensitive to the direction of the Holy Spirit of God? Would you say, okay, God, whatever it is that you want me to do, help me to be willing to do it. Help me to recognize the storms. Help me to recognize your hand in my life. Help me to be sensitive to it. And first of all, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you're running, I, I would love nothing more personally than to have a word of prayer with you and point you back towards Jesus. Some of our elders, some of our deacons will be down front. If there's just something you'd like to pray with them about, we would encourage you to do that. You just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you so much for your word today. Lord, all of us are Jonah. All of us at times in our life have headed in the wrong direction. And God, I pray that you would help us to turn around. Help us to turn around and do that which you want us to do. Help us to fulfill your mission for our lives. And God, I pray that you'd help us, all of us, to run not away from Jesus. Help us to run to Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.